Okay, um, welcome everyone to the, um, to the Midas webinar series. Um, we'll get started, it's a little bit afternoon, even as people are trickling in. Um, so this is the second webinar in the series um, and Midas webinars, as you probably know, will take place uh, every last Friday of the month. And uh, the webinars are aimed to feature research across the wide spectrum of um, work done in the Midas community. Uh, just so you all know, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and slides will be posted online on the events page of the MIDAS website. Um, just as a reminder for those who may not be familiar, MIDAS is a global network of researchers, students and others dedicated to modeling of infectious disease dynamics. Many MIDAS members are working on COVID-19 uh, right now um, and the first um, the couple of our webinars will be about research and feature research on COVID-19. Any researcher, student or professional that's working uh, or, or has an interest in um, the mission and vision of MIDAS, uh, which is centered around modeling of infectious disease dynamics, um, um, is welcome to join uh, the network as a member. And to learn more about the network and the activities that are taking place and the people that are involved, uh, go to the website at MIDASnetwork.us. Uh, I have one announcement um, to make as, uh, the, because there's a collaborative project going on in, the, in our community uh, to combine multiple COVID models into one single decision analytic framework. This project is named Multimodal Outbreak Decision Support, uh, or in short, MODS, and is led by uh, Katriona Shea at Penn State University, and also others are involved. So far, about 30 groups have registered to participate in this, um, in this collaboration. And just um, if people are interested to, to uh, collaborate in this project, um, I am putting the link to the Google Sheet where you can register in the chat um, now so that um, you can still sign up. And then uh, Katia will be in touch later um, today or, or early next week with details about this project and about what the next steps are going to be. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Dr. Tom McAndrew. Uh, Tom is a uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, Biostatistics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He's a computational scientist working at the intersection of biostatistics and data science. He's studying ensemble models, expert prediction and crowdsourcing for forecasting infectious diseases. He received his PhD in mathematical sciences from the University of Vermont, an MS in biostatistics from Georgetown University and a an BS in biomathematics from the University of Scranton. Um, in industry, Tom was also the Associate Director of Biostatistics at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, where he led a team of biostatisticians that designed and analyzed multinational clinical trials. So um, Tom is now working in Nick Reich's lab at UMass Amherst, and you may have seen a lot of the work that they're doing on combining COVID uh, forecasting models into um, uh, one platform, which is very exciting. Um, but Tom will soon be leaving Nick Reich's lab in Amherst. He will move to Pennsylvania uh, as assistant professor at the College of Health at Lehigh University starting July 15th. So big congrats to Tom for that, uh, for that wonderful career move. Um, and he's already planning to organize a summer experience with undergraduate students there to create COVID forecasting systems for PA. And then also last but not least, Tom also expects to become a father of his first child if all goes well in October. So even more congratulations and very exciting times uh, for Tom. So um, without taking more of his time, um, I will hand over to Tom now to give the presentation. Um, if people would like to ask questions, just use the raise hand feature in the panel, in the participants panel, uh, you can uh, do that and or use the chat uh, function and then we will um, unmute people and let them ask questions. And I'll let Tom kind of direct when he wants to stop for that, um, doing the talk. So um, thanks very much. And um, Tom, please go ahead. Hey, thanks, Wilbert. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen. I have a presentation prepared. Let me just... 
Okay, great. First, I want to say thanks to the Midas Network. Uh, always a pleasure to, to see old friends and faces and, um, and always a pleasure to present some research there. Uh, before I start my, my talk, I do want to mention that uh, during this time, there's going to be two, two times where I stop in the presentation and mention that um, you know, I'm taking questions at that time. So I'll be actively looking at the chat and the, uh, the raise your hand features during the talk. Um, those two times and at the end of the, of the talk. And as Wilbert said before, um, him, Stephanie, and Jess will be looking uh, for important chat questions throughout the talk and, and may flag me at that time. And um, that's great. So without further ado, my name is Tom, at Tom McAndrew at UMass Amherst, and we're going to talk a little bit about aggregating expert opinion on COVID-19. The first expert survey we performed was conducted February 17th. Now to put that in perspective, uh, late December 2019, first SARS-CoV-2 cases were reported in Wuhan, China. After this survey, the U.S. announced its first death due to coronavirus. On March 12th, the WHO announced COVID-19 as a pandemic. The IHME model first presented publicly its forecast on March 25th. In April, the forecast hub from the Reich Lab uh, started collating forecasts. <clears throat> And I think this is a little bit out of date, but um, at the time I built this presentation, there was 1.5 million cases and 87,000 deaths, and there's quite a bit more now. This gives you a lay of the land about when our first expert survey was conducted. Let's see what they asked them, what, what the experts were asked. So here's three February 17th questions. And I just want to take, take a minute to read these questions. Uh, do you think that the confirmed case count of COVID-19 in the U.S. reported by WHO on April 1st will exceed 100. Now think about where we are in the, in the timeline, right? It's a long time ago. It's a question we asked. We also asked, as reported by the WHO this coming Sunday, which was February 23rd, will the number of cumulative confirmed cases in the US with possible or confirmed transmission outside of China exceed five? Finally, we asked, what is the smallest, most likely, and largest number of all cumulative confirmed cases, including imported and local transmission in the US, the WHO will report this Sunday, February 23rd. Now let's see how experts answered. The first question is on the left here. Nine out of 15 experts assigned more than 50% probability to there being more than 100 cases by, by April. <clears throat> that means that six experts assigned a probability of equal to or less than 50%. On the next question about more than five cases outside of China on February 23rd, eight out of 15 experts assign a probability greater than one half, which means seven assign a probability equal to or less than. And for that third question, when we asked about the, small, the smallest, most likely and largest number of cases, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have each of the experts. There was 15 for this first survey. On the vertical axis is to the predicted number of cases by February 23rd. And each of these bars represents the smallest, most likely, and largest going from uh, the bottom to the top. And you see uh, 35 cases were truly reported at, at the end, and the experts were able to cover that true number of cases fairly well for this first survey. I want to take a minute and step back now that I've, I've presented a little bit about what experts are, are doing um, and talk about the goal of forecasting. So the goal of forecasting is to provide public health officials actionable information, information they can use to make decisions um, and support decisions. Some examples of those are public health campaigns. So this, this figure on the left here is a campaign to fight the flu. And uh, the recommendations are you know, get vaccinated, wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay at home, cover your cough. Another way that forecasting helps public officials is uh, making sure there's enough vaccine stockpile in the right places at the right time. Finally, a third way, and these are only uh, three select ways public health officials use these forecasts, but a third way is to measure hospital burden, make sure there's enough uh, support in the hospitals to meet demand. So we talked a little bit about the goal of forecasting. Why use, hum why use human judgment? Um, computational models are great. There's no reason to use human judgment, right? Well, in the past, there's been a lot of success uh, using human judgment to build forecasts. Some of the areas are in politics, economics and marketing, ecology, 
engineering and infectious disease. These are just a, a small subset of the number of places where expert judgment has been successful. In particular, in politics, uh, the polyvote system, which is a prediction market used to forecast presidential elections, has been, has been very successful. Uh, experts are, are typically asked to forecast the demand for products in sales. In ecology, uh, experts are usually enlisted to, to work on dynamical systems, and they're asked specifically to forecast parameters for dynamical systems. And that's to predict, uh, for example, fish kills and wildlife populations. In engineering the overliability analysis, experts are typically asked to, to forecast probabilities of system failure. And finally, in infectious disease, um, a great example of a crowdsourcing platform is Epicast. And I have a picture of the Epicast. Just a quick look at the Epicast system. On the horizontal axis here are epidemic weeks. On the vertical axis is influenza-like illness. And what you see are um, past epidemic trajectories. And, and what the Epicast system asks uh, from, its, from, its human judge, from its human judgment um, folks is to draw this season's epidemic curve. It's just a small subset of the, of the ways human judgment has been successful in the past, and it is a reason, um, one of the reasons we're using it now. But who are these experts that, that, we're, that we're asking questions of? So our expert crowd was defined as a researcher who's spent a substantial amount of time designing, building, interpreting uh, infectious disease models or dynamical systems, or they could be associated with policy implications in human populations. So they had to be really involved in building and designing models, um, really understanding of modeling and infectious disease. Uh, there's also an additional requirement that these experts should stay up to date with, with COVID-19 news, um, both social media policy decisions and also objective um, data. Some of the ways that we asked them um, was through email. So as you can probably tell, the MIDAS network is a small, close-knit community and the infectious disease um, modeling community is, is, is not much bigger than that. Um, it's a small, close-knit family and um, we, we asked some, some people that we considered experts to meet this definition if they would be interested in joining. Another way we did this was uh, through formal solicitations. So we did include a uh, solicitation email that was included in a Slack channel for modelers um, of infectious disease specifically related to COVID-19. We also sent a solicitation email um, through the MIDAS, the MIDAS network listserv. And to date, we have 41 different experts um, who, participate, who have participated in our survey, not all at once, but this is the, the pool of experts we have right now. A little bit about survey logistics. So if you are an expert in this survey, you'll receive an email that looks something like this. Um, we'll say, dear Dr. X, Y, and Z, thank you for your previous participation. And what you see here in the first blue highlight text is we provide experts the previous week's one page summary of results. So they're allowed to peruse that, um, just like anybody would be. The next paragraph talks about data anonymity and transparency. Third, we tell uh, experts when the survey will open. It's open when they receive their email and when it will close. Next, there's a few links. There's um, two options to, to join in on the survey and a third option that you, have to, that you can opt out. And finally, underneath feedback for forecasting, this headline here, um, we provide experts feedback for, for all the forecasts they've made in the last week. And we provide for, forecast feedback, feedback for their forecasts in a couple different ways. Um, we tell them what forecast they made, what the truth was if available, and we also provide them the consensus forecast of all expert opinion. Now the reason to, to send personal emails um, is because it creates a social contract which has been shown in behavioral economics to be a bit stronger than a business-like contract, and it builds a default. So by default, every Monday at 10 a.m., um, experts receive this email. It's not a platform that they need to log in on. They're, they don't do anything active to receive this, um, this offer. It's, it's there by default, and defaults have also been shown to be a very, uh, very powerful way to promote activity. We also give feedback on forecasting results um, in the hopes that it'll increase accuracy, and it has been shown in the past to do so. This is a little bit about the, the email that they received, the survey logistics. Let's look at um, what you might see if you click that link. 
So on the left, I have a, a kind of computer screen representation of what you might see in your survey. And on the right is a, uh, a mobile device depiction. So experts are allowed to use either platform. Um, we support both. And you see here kind of the anatomy of a question. So uh, we first provide experts some information. In this case, it's the total number of positive COVID-19 cases in the US over time. We also tell them that uh, as of May 11th, there was 1.3 million total positive cases. So we're giving them some information about the problem. Next is the question ask, what is the number of positive cases in the US that the COVID tracker, which is a specific surveillance system, will have in the daily report this Sunday, May 17th? So first is information, next is the ask. Finally, um, we provided a set of intervals where the true number of positive cases could fall. So we tell experts how we want them to answer this question. Assign a probability to each bin corresponding to your belief how many cases will be reported next Sunday. So in this case, they were, they were given a set of intervals and asked to assign probabilities to those. This is not the only type of question we can ask. There are four types of questions that we're allowed to ask experts. First is categorical. Um, an example is on the right. Do you think that confirmed case count of COVID-19 in the US reported by the WHO on April 1st will exceed 100? We ask a deterministic yes or no question here. That's, that's what we call categorical. It doesn't have to be two options. It can be more, but this is an option. The next is categorical probabilistic. An example on the right, which of the next six months will see the highest total number of deaths nationwide in the US for COVID-19 illness? And here's the categorical probabilistic part. Assign a probability to each month representing the likelihood of peak US deaths occurring in that month. You can see we gave experts options of uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, and we asked them to assign probabilities here. We give two requirements, which are standard requirements of probability, that each number must be between zero and one, and all those numbers must sum to one. Next is a, a question that might, be, might feel a little bit more unique. Uh, this are, these are called triplets. So again, uh, an example on the right, we provide first some information for the experts. This is sometimes called a outside view or base rate. Over the last nine months, the CDC estimates that the seasonal death toll from influenza outbreaks has ranged between 11 and 95,000. So that's this um, sets up a relative and a base rate to help experts answer this question. Here's the triplet part. What are the smallest, most likely, and largest number of deaths that will occur due to COVID-19 by the end of 2020. So the triplet is asking specifically for an expert's predictions of the smallest number of deaths, the most likely number of deaths, and the largest number of deaths. Now we take these three numbers that experts provide us and change it into a probability distribution as follows. So here in this example on the right, um, there is uh, the experts answered 10, 30, and 50 for their smallest, most likely, and largest. We're going to transform this into a triangular probability distribution. That distribution assigns positive probability in between the smallest and the largest. So you can see on the horizontal axis, um, positive probability assigned between 10 and between 50. For their most likely answer, um, that's the mode of this distribution and it's called a triangular probability distribution as you might imagine because of the shape it makes. It is also important to know um, outside the smallest and most likely answers um, is assigned zero probability. And you see that here between zero and 10, there's zero probability assigned there. Not a small number, absolute zero. The final type of question we can ask uh, are percentiles. So again, you see the anatomy of a question here. There's uh, background information, relative thinking about Washington State's seven day average of new cases per day. Here's the question ask. Um, we ask, what is the seven day average? What do you expect the seven day average to be between June 1st and June 7th? And here's the percentile answer. Please report a 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile. In other words, an 80% confidence interval and a median. So we're asking now, instead of the smallest, most likely and largest, we're asking for um, in particular, you know, specific percentiles. Something really neat about this question that, that I'd like to highlight um, that's something experts can do, are counterfactuals. So although we asked for a, a 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile, or in other words, an 80% confidence interval and a median for the seven day average, we also asked this counterfactual. If an accelerator was to start in Washington allowed all counties to enter phase two, they were in um, phase one at the time, some counties, 
And um, the, the majority were in phase one and some were in phase two, but what if you opened up all of them to phase two? Um, what would the seven day average be then? I think it's a neat aspect of, of um, this work is that we can ask people counterfactuals. Before I get to predictions, I wanted to take this time to pause and ask, um, ask the audience if they have uh, particular questions about any of the logistics, uh, who the experts are in some sense. Um, you know, if, there, if there's any questions, I have the chat box open now and I'm gonna click on Q&A. Nate Jacobs asked how you define an expert and I hope that I answered his question. Um, have you brought it in? So Tom, maybe you can go a little bit uh, deeper into that. Like, like um, do you think there is options for including um, non-experts or people yeah. that may not be an expert in outfield, but in other fields maybe? Yep, yep. Um, so, so, so something that's, that's come out of this, I think one of the few good things that's come out of the pandemic is um, stronger collaborations with, with, with others. And we are working with two other crowdsourcing platforms, one called Good Judgment Inc and another called Metaculus, who are um, just amazing, valuable contribu uh, contributors. And they pose the same questions or a subset of the questions that we pose to experts to their crowds. And the crowd that they have is, is not at all an expert crowd necessarily, um, though they are trained in forecasting itself. Uh, Wayne gets asked, do you evaluate the weight and performance of experts? I'm going to get to that. Um, the, quick ag the quick answer is that we explored um, differential weighting of experts, and at the moment found that they don't improve prediction. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that a little, little bit later. And um, let's see, Ozzy, do you think that experts would provide more accurate results than super forecasters or other expert forecasters? Um, so that, that's, that's in a follow-up work. Um, we do plan to compare the, the, the predictions that um, Good Judgment Open, which aren't, they're not super forecasters, they're, they're just, um, there, there's trained forecasters and metaculous forecasters to the experts. And we're also going to um, look at how uh, we could combine kind of non-expert and expert crowds to make more accurate forecasts. I'll take um, maybe one more question from, a, from an anonymous attendee. Do many most experts have some background in respiratory transmission or was any mode of transmission considered as substantial work? Um, good question. I, I think you our definition was infectious disease. I think most, if not all of the experts here had worked in respiratory uh, diseases, but it wasn't a, a strict requirement. Okay, let's talk, I'm gonna close this Q&A and I'm gonna close the chat for now. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the good stuff. Let's talk about predictions, right? First prediction we'll talk about are uh, deaths. So the question we asked experts, over the last nine seasons, the CDC estimates the seasonal death toll from influenza has ranged between 11 and 95,000. That's that relative base information. What are the smallest, most likely, and largest number of deaths that will occur due to coronavirus by the end of 2020? So I'm asking for the cumulative number of deaths in the US due to COVID. We asked uh, for two types of answers throughout our four surveys that we asked this question. One was a triplet, smallest, most likely, and largest number of deaths. We also asked for percentiles, uh, in particular the fifth, 50th and 95th percentile this is the question. Here are the answers. Um, first on the horizontal axis here, you see the date the survey was issued to experts starting on March 16th all the way to April 20th. On the vertical axis is the predicted number of deaths by the end of 2020 in the US. These light blue bars represent the fifth and 95th percentile or in other words, a 90% confidence interval. The black circles are 50th uh, percentiles or medians. Above each bar are the reported number of deaths and cases at that time by the COVID tracker. And on the bottom below this figure in the horizontal is just some contextual information about what was happening in public health policy, um, social media, just kind of general news um, that was happening around these, these forecasts. The first observation is that between 150,000 to 250,000 deaths by the end of 2020 are predicted by experts. Overall, um, it was over just, just over a month of predictions being made. Um, a lot of different news and media and policy um, implications were occurring. 
But these predictions are fairly stable over time. Uh, for the first three surveys, it was somewhere between two and 250. And in this last survey, it was 150,000. But they've been relatively stable, I think, given the, the changing environment. That said, there is some, some substantial uncertainty in the, in the death toll by the end of 2020. Experts assigned um, in the first survey the fifth percentile to below 50,000 and their 95th percentile to above 1 million. Um, that held for the second survey. And just about for the third survey too, they predicted above 50,000, but still above 1 million could occur. It's interesting to note this last survey, which seems to look a little bit different. Um, the predictions look a little bit different than the other three. Just because in the first three um, surveys, we asked for a triplet. We asked the smallest, most likely, and largest number of deaths. In this latest one, we asked about percentiles. So we asked specifically for the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile. What you see is that there's a, a smaller range of uncertainty there in those percentiles, and also a smaller point estimate. You know, we're considering the median a point estimate. Um, so how you ask the question depends on how people answer. And that's something that's been found um, in, in past literature. Next, we'll talk about hospitalizations. Question we asked, which of the next six months will see the highest total number of hospitalizations nationwide in the U.S. for COVID-19 illness? That's the question. How do we want you to answer? Assign a probability to each month representing the likelihood of peak U.S. hospitalizations occurring in that month. Each number is between zero and one and sum to one. Those are the restrictions. Here's an example of the answers they could give um, between March and August. Let's look at predictions. On the bottom horizontal axis, you have the months that experts were allowed to assign probabilities to. On the left vertical are the four surveys where we asked experts this question. Again, on the right vertical, you see, um, again, contextual information about public health policy and um, you know, media that was, that was kind of going on during, during those times they were asked. First observation is that experts feel hospitalizations will peak uh, between April and June. Now, if you look at the months between March and June, um, this probability over from March 23rd to April 13th is fairly consistent. It started at a probability of 0 0.76, ended at a 0 0.84 probability. Not, not a huge amount of change given all the different um, you know, policy decisions and, and media that was kind of swirling around at this time. But for the months of July and August, um, there still is an appreciable probability, even, in April, even on, on April 13th, assigned to a peak of hospitalizations in July or August. So um, it started at 0 0.24 on March 23rd. But even now on April 13th, uh, experts still assign a 12% probability of, of peak hospitalizations occurring in July or August. Let's keep talking about predictions. Uh, this time, total infections. Here's the question that we asked. As of Monday, March 9th, for example, what percentage of, what percentage of all COVID-19 infections in the US, symptomatic or asymptomatic, doesn't matter, do you believe are reported as confirmed cases? So we're asking for a fraction of confirmed cases. This figure is a lot to unpack, so let's, let's take it one at a time. Uh, on the top panel here, the horizontal axis is the date the forecast was made. On the vertical is the predicted total US SARS-CoV-2 infections. In green are each of the expert predictions of the total number of SARS-CoV-2 infections they think um, were there at that time. The interval is, is an 80% confidence interval. Uh, to say it another way, the bottom part of the bar is 10th percentile, the top 90th, and these diamonds um, in the center are the, fit, the median. In these other colors, blue, red, yellow, and purple, are computational models predictions of the total number of SARS-CoV-2 infections. Um, you see from left to right, there's a Sentinel event estimate by Lover and McAndrew, stochastic simulation by Perkins et al., um, what I call a seed event model by Bedford, and um, most recently a complementary approaches model by Lou et al. In black are the confirmed, the reported confirmed cases by the COVID tracker. Um, the first observation here uh, that I see is that experts and computational models tend to agree on their forecasts. Um, I th and I think that has kind of a 
a complementary approach. I think that expert forecasts being close to computational models strengthens computational models. And just the same, I think computational model forecasts being similar to what experts are reporting um, strengthens, their, strengthens their forecasts too. I think another um, result is that these predictions that experts give are above this black line of confirmed cases. You know, experts have felt over this time from March 2nd uh, to April 6th, so just a little bit over a month, that um, there are more infections than are being confirmed or reported. Let's look at this bottom panel to, to, to look at this forecasting situation a little bit differently. Um, in this bottom panel, I want you to look at uh, the horizontal axis here is the percent of total SARS-CoV-2 infections thought to be confirmed. And the left vertical are the six surveys and when they were issued. And in blue here is the probability that experts assigned uh, to the percent of total SARS-CoV-2 infections confirmed. These black boxes in each of the, the horizontal surveys is the median estimate. Overall, the median um, stays pretty consistent. I think it was 16% in the first survey, and after that, it was somewhere in the 14 to 15% of all cases have been confirmed. And you see overall, um, the majority of probability is assigned to, to less than 20%. I see two questions. I wasn't going to stop, but I think maybe I'll, I'll it's a good time to. Um, Aaron Mordecai asked, were any of the experts surveyed involved in the computational models you discuss? The answer is yes, they were. Um, are some experts using models, but you don't know, but you don't know they are? Yeah, um, we have asked at certain points, um, what fraction of models versus intuition experts have, have used? And there's a broad range. Some experts report saying that they rely pretty heavily on models they've seen or models that they've run. Um, and other experts say that, that it's really intuition that they're using to make these predictions. So it runs the gambit. That's a great question. I see, I'll take, I'll take, well, okay, that's, yeah. Great, okay, no more over questions. Let's go to confirm cases. This is my last um, you know, talk, uh, prediction here. The question that we asked, um, so we provided some information. So we say, as shown in the table above, COVID tracker reported 750 some thousand total confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. as of a certain date. Here's the question. What is the total number of, of confirmed cases in the U.S. that the COVID tracker will have in the daily report this coming Sunday? Remember, they're asked on a Monday and the survey closes on Tuesday. So at this Sunday, how many confirmed cases will, will there be? Here's an option for one of the ways we've asked them to report confirmed cases. These are intervals. Uh, starting at less than 850,000 and ending at greater than 1.1 million confirmed cases. Again, this is a, um, a big figure, so let, let's take our time. First, on the horizontal axis for this upper panel, we have the dates of the forecast, not the date that they were asked, the date of the forecast. On the vertical axis is confirmed COVID-19 cases. Now in blue, um, the blue bar is the fifth and 95th, or in other words, a 90% confidence interval. The dark blue circles are the median expert estimates, and the black circles are the reported cases from the COVID tracker at that time. This is an opportunity where we have um, some ground truth to evaluate. Um, first, the first observation, the 90% prediction interval from this expert consensus covers the truth seven out of eight times. Uh, which is 87%. So um, that result kind of suggests experts might be calibrated um, for forecasting confirmed cases, at least to this surveillance system. Oops, let's go back there. Um, you also see that these dark blue circles, um, they start at, at some points kind of fairly far away from the true reported cases, but over time have become much better. Um, so experts have, have gained in accuracy over time. And we can look at that performance a little bit closer or more rigorously in this bottom panel. So again, the horizontal axis is the date of the forecast that, is, that corresponds to the top panel. The vertical axis is relative forecast skill. It's just a measure of, of accuracy, expert accuracy. Uh, and what it is relative to is an unskilled forecaster, which we show here with this uh, dotted horizontal black line through the figure. So in this case, um, if your forecast skill was zero, that means you're just about as good as an unskilled forecaster at that point in time. 
These light blue circles are individual experts' skills. The dark blue diamonds are the average, what we call the average expert skill, which is the average of these individual forecast skills. And finally, this black, uh, this dark blue dot, which we'll get to in a minute, is the consensus forecast uh, accuracy. So again, you see, I think, um, pretty clearly, you know, uh, starting on March 29th, expert skill increased at that time. Um, there were some experts before that who were doing better than an unskilled forecaster. There was other experts who were doing much worse than an unskilled forecaster. Um, but over time, you do see this kind of increase in this dark blue diamond, the average expert. So they've done better over time. It is important to note that in the first uh, two surveys, we did not give experts forecasting feedback like we did, like I had discussed. Um, they just made forecasts kind of, and we didn't say much about it. Let's get to consensus. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how we aggregated experts' um, predictions. We took this approach, this kind of very traditional approach in combination forecasting called a linear pool. Um, the P sub E, uh, so on the right-hand side, of, let's look at the right-hand side of the equals. P sub E of X is the expert's forecast. So if they gave the smallest, most likely, and largest prediction, this P sub E of X is their triangular probability distribution. Just to the left of this triangular probability distribution is pi sub I, that's an expert-specific weight that we can assign to them. There's two requirements for those weights. One is that they have to be non-negative, shown below here, right? Pi sub I has to be greater than or equal to zero. And the sum of all those weights has to be equal to one. In some sense, this is a weighted uh, average of predictive densities given to us by experts. And that's what I represent as a linear pool. This we call linear pool. I'm on the left hand side of the equals here, P of X. This is how we're building our consensus. Um, the weights that we chose for all of these forecasts that I've showed you are equal weights. So every expert, if they participated, for example, if 20 experts participated, the weight that each expert received is one over 20. This is kind of our, our measure of um, expert skill and expert, expert forecasting accuracy. I think that they've done very well considering um, all the different changing um, policy decisions, public health actions, um, you know, social media and all that influence and, and a lot of literature and objective data. They did pretty good. So before I, before I recap, actually, um, I wanna take another pause and just ask for any questions or comments about the prediction, just the prediction part of um, either deaths, hidden infections, hospitalizations, confirmed cases. Does anybody have, uh, anybody have any particular questions or, um, or thoughts? Mark raised his hand. I would love to, uh, to call on Mark. Let me see how I do that. Or, or maybe um, Stephanie or Jess, you can help me call on Mark. Hi, Tom. This is Mark, and um, it was an accident. I did not mean to raise my hand, but thank you. You didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. Uh, John Dre, can you explain in more detail what the unskilled forecaster baseline means? Yeah, I can. Um, so the unskilled forecaster for these eight surveys, what we did was we took uh, every expert's prediction, and they gave a smallest uh, prediction, right? So we took the minimum smallest prediction from every expert, and we took the maximum uh, largest prediction, that, that entire range was given a uniform probability distribution. That's our unskilled forecaster. So we looked at um, just kind of the largest possible range any expert could have given us and assigned it a uh, uniform probability. That's a good question. There's some questions in the, in the chat, oh, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, let's see. Sophie, can you explain a bit more about how you calculate the relative for, okay, I maybe I answered that one. Oh, sorry, no, I didn't. It's relative forecast skill. Yeah, so relative forecast skill is going to be the probability that the expert assigned divided by the probability that the um, unskilled forecaster would assign minus one. So if they assign, if the relative, if a expert assigned a forecasting skill the same as the unskilled forecaster, that fraction would be one. One minus one is zero. Uh, okay, okay, I'm going to get to Joey. And Tobias, uh, interesting work. Have you considered setting the weights using past performance? Yes, we have. Um, I've run through maybe five to 10 different um, weighting algorithms that, that I've kind of thought up. Um, 
it did change performance, uh, uh, forecasting performance. And sometimes, sometimes it was it was better. Other times it was worse. Um, but I just don't think we have enough data yet to, to really definitively say, you know, we should pick this one weighting differential weighting model. But I do look forward to collecting more data, and um, and deciding on on a, on a model like that. Uh, Tobias, can you explain the difference between consensus and average expert? Yes, <clears throat> average expert is um, the average skill an expert assigned during that survey. So I took all the different relative forecasting skills and just took the average. Consensus is a little bit different because the consensus forecast is a single forecast. And I, and I take that, um, the consensus forecast is a linear pool, right? so it's a combination of predictive densities. And I look at what probability they assign to the truth that's my relative forecasting skill for a consensus. All great questions. Um, okay, Deepak raised hand. There you go. I think you're still on mute, though. How do I oh, unmute? Let's see here. Unmute audio. Yeah. Have you considered this? Uh... Uh, SEIR model also algorithm for uh, you know this R naught predictions. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we we haven't asked experts to provide predictions of R naught yet, um, but it's it's definitely an option, and um, and I I do think that it's in the back of our minds. You know, um, I think now in the future. You know, in this early forecasting phase, we were asking experts to provide kind of direct forecasts. I do think as time moves on, experts can serve a complementary role also um, to, to statistical or computational models. And I think um, asking questions like that, you know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on what the parameter estimates are at this point? Um, could be helpful for statistical forecasting models, like an SIR or SEIR model. So I do no, because I, mm -hmm. country like India, where the cases are rising and, you know, we are not are able to understand where it's going to end. Mm. And uh, uh, so that is the, what I have coming into my mind, you know, having a very good and robust compartmental model. Yeah. Is it going to help the country like India? Mm. Um, you know, that's a question. That's probably a question for my 41 experts, uh, including me. I don't, I don't know if I feel comfortable answering it by itself, but I don't think, um, I think a good compartmental model um, can provide, you know, very reasonable estimate. Okay, I think Tom, um, let's move <clears throat> forward and then you have okay. time to finish up your talk and then we can have an open discussion afterwards. Great, so that's a quick recap. Um, experts gave fast calibrated forecasts of the early COVID outbreak to support decision making directly. As I said, we're gonna shift now to maybe um, giving direct estimates, but also to a complementary role to support decision making and forecasting. Um, I wanted to mention uh, two amazing collaborators, Good Judgment Inc. and Metaculus. I mentioned them earlier. Um, can't thank them enough for posing their questions to their crowds and providing us forecasts from their um, trained forecasters. I also wanted to kind of give a plug that um, I'm going to be running a, a separate um, project with asking for experts in vaccines and therapeutics. If you are an expert in vaccines and therapeutics of, of infectious disease, um, or if you know someone who, please email me at mccandrew at umass.edu. That's at the bottom left. And just some thank yous. Um, first, thank you to the Reich Lab. Uh, you know, it's been my lab for, for two years and I um, had so much fun and um, couldn't thank them enough for this, for the experience. I'm gonna miss everybody when I do leave and, and uh, head over to Lehigh as a professor. And I, I think it goes without saying thank you to the experts, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. Thank you to the, you know, thank you. you you're the reason this project has um, been so successful and you are really the, the powerhouse behind it. Um, these are just some of the experts who've answered two or more surveys and I can't thank you enough. And um, I'll probably be thanking you again as you provide more, more predictions. Uh, th there's also, you know, if you consider yourself an expert based on this definition and are interested in participating in the monthly format that we're going to be running, please email me at mccandra at umass.edu. We'll, you'll go through a vetting process. And um, if, if um, you're willing to participate, we'll be sending you emails just like the ones I showed earlier. I wanted to say thank you to, to everybody and um, any follow-up questions.
So let's, um, we can go to the chat and then we can unmute the people who ask the questions. So we have a little bit more of an interactive discussion or people can raise their hand, which makes it easier for us to unmute people since they go to the top of the list. Um, so John had a couple of questions. So I'll, I'll let, uh, allow John to talk for now. And, um, let's see, it's already done. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for that talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious about the uh, information that you might have on individual forecasters performance. And I was wondering whether you intend to look at individual forecasters longitudinal performance to see if some are learning more than others, or if um, uh, they're particularly consistent in what their bias is or um, how their variance matches the, um, uh, the variance of the, uh, of the group uh, or the variance of the um, estimates once you know them. Yeah. And then I was thinking, well, if, if there are consistencies over time, can't they be measured? Uh, and then couldn't those measures be leveraged for improved consensus forecasts? Okay, so, okay, so there's two questions. Um, have we scored individual forecasters longitudinally? Yes. Um, I haven't presented that data here, but we do have individual um, log scores and the probability they assign to ground truth through time. Um, I, th I think, you know, even though you asked it as a question, I think it's actually a really great idea um, to measure them longitudinally. I have not looked at their scores over time for individual experts, um, but that's a really great idea um, and adjusting for them or looking at if they're biased in a certain direction. Um, I'm going to, I actually have a pen and paper that I'm going to write that down <laughs> for because um, it's a great idea, John. Uh, and I'd also be interested in knowing like, do some forecasters get better or, mm -hmm. uh, or is there sort of um, the error tends to be consistent throughout the, uh, the whole exercise? You're right, because I only looked at the average expert, didn't I, over time, which doesn't really link them through time, right? It doesn't say if the individual expert improved, it just said, did the group improve? It's good to look at them, um, you know, linked through time, isn't it? Um, more questions. I see, I see. Uh, Mark, even have you heard that pandemics have a fat tail? I've heard pandemics have a fat tail distribution. This affect how you formulate your questions. Um, yeah, you know, it could. I, I really like the experts to speak for themselves. The intervals we, we provide are kind of constrained in some sense. Um, I think it will affect how the experts answer, though. I see Mary Castro is, uh, is up on the chat there, maybe, or the Q&A box. Here, I'm giving Matt, um, Matthew Saragossa, he asks about um, giving people feedback, if that improves their performance. You want to ask yeah. the question? Yeah. Uh, um, sure, it's uh, pretty redundant to John's, I think. Um, so ditto in a sense. Um, but I guess, yeah, really just reiterating the question of uh, when you look at the absolute performance of maybe persistently high quality forecasters or you know, uh, unbiased forecasters, um, how their performance changes when they receive feedback, um, whether mm -hmm. the group is sort of being pulled up toward them or whether um, everybody's moving to a mean. Um, and then I guess a sort of a follow-up question is with regard to the non-pharmaceutical you know, pharmaceutical interventions, um, it would be interesting to look at how forecasters are able to you know, predict uh, changes in uh, case rates resulting from uh, different sorts of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Yeah, yeah, so um, so for the non-pharmaceutical interventions question, I'll answer them in reverse order maybe. Um, for the MPIs, we do ask questions, um, kind of counterfactual questions about the impact that certain um, actions might, you know, might make on cases um, or deaths. Um, so we have asked those questions. I'm sorry I didn't display them here, but um, in a, in a follow-up paper coming quite soon, um, we do plan to kind of open up to more questions. Um, and yeah, I, I, I wish that um, we had looked at, you know, I, I guess I wish that forecasting skill before and after we started getting feedback um, kind of noticeably jumped. Um, it did jump over time, but it was only a few weeks after providing feedback. And I don't know if that means it just takes some time to learn how to understand feedback um, that you're receiving and adjust your estimates. Um, and I, or if it had no impact, uh, I, think it, I think it is a useful tool and it's been used in the past very well. Um, I just, yeah, we, did, we didn't have a good experimental design to measure you know, whether feedback increased their, increased their performance.
Okay, Wilbert, I'm letting you. Uh, I'm letting you run it. I see all, all sorts of people are raising hands. Okay, so uh, Wayne here, and then Nick will. I'll give Nick. Oh boy. Yeah. Go so um, the question I want to ask uh, pertains to data quality. Firstly, are you going to ask experts to talk about, to to evaluate data quality? And secondly, when you look at the performance of experts, sometimes they predicting uh, what bad data rather than the real situation is going to say. And what makes me say this is that if you look at a lot of the incidence data, it's obvious that some days it jumps. So they including cases from maybe a week ago. In other cases, incidence is even negatively reported, which means they're correcting past errors, but they're not telling people exactly how those were done. Mm. Yeah, revisions in a surveillance system are, are always kind of a pervasive issue, aren't they? So um, I do think as, as experts, as we shift experts to a, a complementary approach, um, as well as a direct uh, prediction approach, I could see us asking about data quality for certain surveillance systems. I do know that some surveillance systems um, rate their own data quality, but maybe for ones that don't, I could see experts, you know, us asking experts on a scale from one to 10, how good is this data? And about revisions, yeah, um, and, and predicting on bad data, you know, we've been careful about incidents. Um, we've asked usually cumulative cases and we've asked um, maybe averages over a week or over two weeks to try and tamp down some of these fluctuations. Um, but you make a good point that um, you know, we are in some cases predicting a surveillance system, what, what a surveillance system will say. Um, in other times when, I ask, when we ask about the total number of SARS-CoV-2 infections, that's kind of a, a measure of, of not the surveillance system, but what's really happening. Okay, thanks. No, you're very welcome. Mary, please, you've been waiting. Uh, you're still muted. I'm going to unmute you. No, I can't. Mary Christine, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, otherwise, we'll have to move on. Okay, I'm going to uh, allow Nick to talk and then um, uh -oh. Nick, I'm you can unmute problem. yourself and talk. Okay, can you all hear me? Yep. <clears throat> um, I just, I wanted to add one or two things to Tom's response to the few questions from John and somebody, someone else about um, sort of longitudinal performance of experts over time. So we did a really deep dive onto this after, I don't know, it was maybe week five or six or so. So we've collected a bunch of data since then and it's probably worth revisiting. But mm -hmm. at that time, what we were seeing was that there was so much variation among within an expert across time mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that it, it was really hard to do. And this is also relevant to the question about sort of weighting weighting experts differently we basically it it wasn't possible to discern consistent pa consistent enough patterns we had some people who were really good had gave really accurate answers for a few weeks in a row and then completely tanked in you know for one or two weeks and then went back to being good so and and similarly in other with in other combinations of that so it was we tried numerous things because we felt like such an it should be such an obvious thing to do, and we've heard from so many other, uh, so much other similar work that there had been benefits. Um, but we, at least in our small sample, which was also hampered by, um, you know, not having exactly the same um, set of experts each from one week to another, that we just we didn't see consistent enough benefits. There were like hints that there might be something there and maybe now again after a few more weeks of data collection it might be worth going back to. Mm -hmm. um, but but we it just it, it just wasn't quite a consistent enough benefit to uh, warrant the switch. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. That's um, it was just you're you're right, Nick. That it was um, very variable um, over over time, which made it hard to it makes it hard to to build a model that that uses predictive performance, doesn't it? Okay, Nate uh, Jacobs had a question. Okay. Oh, Nate asked, um, how do you think about the mental model experts use to make predictions, and specifically any relationship to actual models? Have you considered asking any question that could help dig up this bit for each expert? I also unmuted him in case he would like oh, to say something right. or add right. to it. Yeah, no, you, you read it. That was, that was my question. Um, I guess I can kind of see power in both, um, you know, just kind of getting away from the, uh, the, the specifics of the model and just kind of like, you know, having a feeling about something. But then I, I, I'm also just kind of curious, if you were asking about, you know, if they were kind of running their own models and, and using that in their, in their, the data that they're giving you. Um, so yeah, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no, of course. I, we, we did ask, um, I, think, I think twice we asked, um, you know, what, what percentage of your expert prediction is relying on a model or like a model that you've seen or a model that you've built versus mm -hmm. intuition? And um, the range was pretty big. I think it was, you know, some experts said like 80% of their, of their predictions were based on a model that they've oh. either seen in literature or built and others, 20%. Um, so um, it, yeah, it did. It, I was actually surprised. I was surprised by the by the the wide range of experts relying on models or relying on intuition. Um, Do you think that there's, um, I guess, predictive value in, in them relying too heavily on a model versus not? Um, uh, yeah, just I guess in the future. I mean, I guess like kind of thinking forward. Yeah, yeah. You're touching on something that um, that Granger had mentioned uh, called information sets, where it's mm -hmm. just um, there's this idea that um, if they are relying on a model, um, that model has a certain kind of set of information it uses to make predictions, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you rely on intuition, you might have a broader, um, you know, broader information set, a broader kind of, you know, sources of data to pull from, right? Maybe experts are, are relying on past experiences. Um, maybe they're relying on the news and media, maybe something, there's this cue called the broken leg cue, which um, says if something really big happened, experts should be able to predict better than a model. Um, so I, I, I think that um, it can go either way. I like that there's a, a kind of a high entropy of using models versus intuition. Um, I think it just allows us to pull on, on, on subjective data that isn't in objective um, structured formats. Um, and we still get some of the benefits from, from experts relying on models, kind of more stable predictions too. I think there's benefits to that. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, we've reached uh, one o'clock. Um, right. It's been very nice to have you. Um, thanks so much for you, for your great talk and really interesting work on, uh, on experts instead of uh, computer models. Um, also, thanks to all the participants um, for great discussion and for joining in. Um, just want to let you know the recordings will be on the Midas website at the past events page or the webinar series page. Um, and the next webinar will take place Friday, uh, last Friday of June 26th, and will be Michaela Martinez uh, from Columbia University talking about immunopathology and immunity of SARS-CoV-2. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, thanks, Tom. Take care. Bye. Hey, thanks, everybody.